Hello. Hello and welcome to the IntensiveCareHotline.com podcast. IntensiveCareHotline.com helps families of critically ill patients in intensive care to instantly improve their lives so that they can make informed decisions, get peace of mind, control, power, and influence, even if you're not a doctor or a nurse in intensive care. In today's episode, I've got a very special guest. For the second time, I want to welcome Penny in the UK. Hi, Penny. How are you? Hi, Patrick. I'm absolutely I'm fine. Yes, good, good to be back with you. Thank you for listening as well. Okay. Yes, thank you so much for coming back for part two of the interview. Um, last week, we've spoken about your husband's pre-medical mm-hmm. history, what led mm-hmm. him to go into a care facility, and then we pretty much stopped where he was about to go in intensive care. So I, I said, um, you know, we, we have to leave mm-hmm. our listeners with a cliffhanger um, to make it <laughs> to make it uh, <laughs> um, have a little bit of tension so they come back for the second episode, which I'm sure, sure they do. And uh, we want to just continue basically where we stopped last time, um, where your husband went into ICU. Um, that's great. Yeah, and just um, repeat this. This is like a scenario that ha- affected me and my um, acceptance of what was going on, my judgments, my intuition, because. A few months before, when Terry actually did have the same, exactly the same type of grand mal seizures, that, and he went into intensive care in the same hospital, he was in for two days, he was tubed, he was given antibiotic, but he was fine, he, he good, had a good heart, he coped with this 120-something a minute that was on the monitor, and then he went, was moved up to a high dependency unit, treated well, into the ward for a few days, treated well, and then he went back to the care home. Now, I assumed that that would be the same thing that happened last year, last April or 27th, when I had the phone call to say, so he's had, you know, grandma seizures and he's back in intensive care. Um, so when I, oh, the only difference between the year before was the do not resuscitate had, had been, um, River, so he wanted to live, right? Now that was sort of sets the scene. And I went in to visit and saw him exactly the same as before, with the tube being very well nursed. I, you know, can't fault the the way that the doctors are there. And there's one doctor or nurse for each patient. I was, I've always been very impressed with the gadgetry and the monitoring. <laughs> yeah, incredible. And well, this is the, the whole thing that. Um, um, what I didn't know was, and I had, I just reminded me, I had a power of attorney for Terry because um, when he had problems with the head injury, and that's right, and the um, cocodamol giving a lot of like, a deterioration of his uh, brain, really, and mental powers. On good days, he's brilliant, and we have some really good chats, and on poor days, he wasn't making decisions, so I had the power of attorney. Mm-hmm. That was in the records, and that was happened in 2014, so it was two years before I had power of attorney. Mm-hmm. And what I didn't know was that a consultant, the same consultant that actually misdiagnosed him when he had the head injury, suddenly saying he you know, had a seizure and fell down the stairs, well, he'd never had a seizure before. It's really strange, isn't it, yeah. how you get these sort of... Yeah, and I, sort of, I, don't know, and I think we've, we've talked about this last time that he was misdiagnosed. Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, what what this control in, in a funny way, I'm, I'm you know been a school teacher 27 years. I've been used to try and see things from other perspectives because when mm. you're teaching children, you yeah. you have to do that. And what he actually did was see Terry in a very very weakened state. You know, come touch. You've seen so many, haven't you? Yeah. In intensive care, and, and, I, and the very few I've seen, it just pulls at your heartstrings, doesn't it? I mean, if his training. I feel, and I haven't contacted the guy yet because I'm going to wait to see what happens with the ombudsman and so on, that he thought he was helping Terry by tripling his anticonvulsant drug straight away without doing it gradually. I've not got to the bottom of that. I did ask you in the meeting for this to be 
looked at and it wasn't. And in fact, this uh, consultant wasn't invited to the meeting. Um, now, that, for Terry, who had a history of being extremely sensitive to chemicals, I remember saying last um, interview time, they're not all built like cart horses. <laughs> One yeah. size does not fit all. And I mean, that was in his records, they knew that. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, and and there are so, really I really got to throw in there, Penny, that yeah. you know you you say that one size doesn't fit all, and I agree with that. The problem in hospitals and you know in in, in intensive care as well is there yeah. often is this one size fits all approach. So they would be mm -hmm. they would have looked at your husband like oh he's got seizures, so we've got this protocol for seizure management, and we will be giving mm -hmm. him the same drugs than we give the next ten patients that have seizures and the previous mm -hmm. ten patients. Right, and that mm. is this one size fits all. That's not necessarily appropriate for the individual. No, certainly not for Terry. I've never known anyone so, you know, so sensitive really to only have try and have organic food and so on. Anyway, I didn't know this, so um, he went up to um, um, as planned to the high dependency unit, mm -hmm. but that was when things started to take on a, 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 a turn. Oh, that's right. Let me just go back to um, in, intensive care because I was very impressed as well when they gave him a feed through the nasogastric tube. And he was only semi-conscious because he didn't like that. Well, I remember last time when he was in, and I think they did that two or three times um, in um, the high dependency unit, and he pulled the tube out. He didn't yep. like it. <laughs> it can't feel very good, can it, when you think about it? But, but as you know from your experience, which you've taught me quite a bit this morning, having that little chat we had before we came on the, you know, the recorded interview, that it's important to to get some food into the stomach to protect it and because of the acid. And the, and the, again, I really was, um, you know, pleased. But then when I found out that there were some um, things in, to, in some ingredients in the um, liquid food and it's made by a company called Nutricia which is global but I prompted me to do some more investigation so again you know I was learning things and I didn't know that they had sodium fluoride which I don't think you're too familiar with Patrick but perhaps some no. of the listeners are <laughs> well it's a gateway to do a lot of investigation I can tell you this is just sodium fluoride being adopted for um, supposed teeth you know, helping to, it, it's, it's based on a lot of um, lies, basically. <laughs> but if it was calcium fluoride, a natural mineral from the earth, I wouldn't have had any problem at all, but I was very surprised um, at that ingredient, as well as the salt that is the um, sodium chloride, again, which can cause side effects, which, again, if there's any side effects going from any of the drugs carry in the past, when he was more stressed, suffered from them. Um, so anyway, we, we went um, up to an HCU, mm -hmm. and I was just visiting. I didn't really feel, I think it's quite important to stress, that I had to talk to the doctors when he came out of the high dependency unit, um, the, um, intensive care, because obviously the doctors were around a lot there. You know, I mean, I was, again, very impressed with the whole setup because I was expecting the same to ha happen as last year. Mm -hmm. So when I went in um, to visit on, I think it was just before we went up to the ward, I was so surprised um, after he was sit literally, he sat up in bed for the first time, this is a visit before, he was joking with his nurses, I must tell you this because it was just, to you know, his sense of humour was amazing. We used to have so many laughs. One of the nurses came to his bed and knelt down, and Terry looked down at her and said, what are you doing? And she said, well, it's all right, I'm just tidying up. And he looked at her with a smile and said, I'll tidy you up. And we, we all laughed. And that was, again, a false sense of security on my part. So right. that's how I felt when I went in next time. Yeah. And he was nearly not sitting up, he was clutching his stomach, groaning, moaning, calling out with pain. I thought, what, what's happening? I have no idea. I go and run and fetch the nurse. Yeah. Uh, they're busy. It's a busy ward, very busy. 
he came over, oh, I'll give him some paracetamol. And I, and I was really, really worried. Now, that, I think, is worth highlighting when I did look at the records and the ward notes, and obviously the report that came back from the um, trust after I'd written my, about my concerns. And this is very and, uh, strange to see that the report of that ex um, those symptoms, very stressful symptoms that Terry had, this horrible pain, was described as some discomfort and then serious stomach pain. There was two different types of descriptions, which is, is strange because, well, anyway. And that was we, in, we, we, and let, let me just clarify the opinion, that was in HDU. HDU for investigation. In HDU? Yeah, just before we went into up to the ward. Yeah. Okay, and and just yeah. to clarify for our American listeners or for our listeners in North America, HDU stands for high dependency. High dependency. It's mainly yeah. a UK thing. I think some are, some ICUs in in America have HDUs as well, but it's mainly a UK sort yeah. of. It's a step down from ICU. That's just uh, for yeah, our American listeners. Yeah, ready for patients to go onto a ward, mm -hmm. which. Um, yeah, ready for discharge, which yeah, pretty much. I still thought would happen. Yeah. Um, and in my way of thinking, I knew how sensitive he was, and I thought, oh, I wonder if he's having a little reaction to the sodium fluoride in the in the feed. Um, you know, it just crossed my mind. So again, I didn't make a huge fuss. But looking mm. back, knowing what I know now, yeah. having done my research on the, that was, I absolutely would take a lot of money on this, but that's when he starts to experience the gastrointestinal hemorrhage. Yeah, and, and I can, and I really want to explain to our listeners very briefly that mm. about 20 or 30 years ago in ICU, most patients didn't get nutrition early on. They were giving, in, they were giving intravenous nutrition rather than mm. nasogastric feeds, which is feeds into their stomach, which is what's happening nowadays, because 20 or 30 years back, by patients not having nasogastric feeds, a lot of them were ending up with ulcers in their stomach and they end up bleeding mm. and the mortality patients dying was much higher than <laughs> now, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So, but in, in, in your husband's case, it still didn't stop him from bleeding. No, well, he was on a blood thing, you see. That's something else. Yeah, I yeah, that's he was thing, on the yeah. same four drugs that he was on when he was in the care home. And then I stepped back and didn't have any, you know, I didn't have much input on that because uh, I think I'm saying last time when he went in the care home, he was suicidal. I thought, well, this may be a way if he's going to actually make his chance, you know, to go by having the drugs. But he, he got used to them and they weren't very high um, dosage, you know. Um, but, and I know one was um, an anticonvulsant, one was an antidepressant, and I think one was a, um, one for the stomach. But there was only... But then when I looked at the um, ward notes and records, he's on seven, and that's paracetamol. That's mm -hmm. right, paracetamol. The Ketra, Levit, yep. and Levit. Ketra, Levit, Levit, Levit. Yeah, Levit. Phenytoin. Right. Phenytoin. Ciprofloxacin. Ciprofloxacin, yeah. Complaining. Two antibiotics. Right. Anoxaparin and yep. ranipidine. Now, right. to tell you, that would be an absolute disaster. Mm. I didn't even know this and didn't think to inquire. I was caught up with, you know, a lot of things happening at home here as well. Mm. Various other things, you know, my sister actually passed away two weeks before Terry, right. so she was in the hospital. She was very, you know, I was coping with all that as well. Um, yeah, she was two years older than me, my only sister, but um, another story, isn't it? <laughs> Mm. And uh, so, so when I saw, well, he's given a blood thinner. How on earth then would the bleeding stop? It wouldn't. Well, did they? Oh, there is no least, way that anything. That that I need to need to ask that question then. So he was getting the blood thinner, which is pretty much standard for any patient in ICU slash HDU, unless they have a mm. bleeding condition. But he didn't have it up to this point. So then my next question yes. is. Did they stop the clexane when he started bleeding? Do you know? They never knew his stomach was bleeding. They, nobody ever knew. Not as the days went past, which then oh, I witnessed the I severe deterioration, which started to really worry me. And all that was written in the notes was, oh, it's flat today. And right. then no concern. 
no concern that this is what I really feel I'm highlighting is what on earth are these doctors and nurses? What do they see when you know a lot of them are brilliant? I mean, I like all of them. I've liked everyone until they prove to be you know yeah. sort of get my suspicions up. Yeah, and you think that especially in an environment like HDU, which is a step down from mm -hmm. ICU, where where you still should mm -hmm. have trained ICU nurses. You would think mm -hmm. that people would pick up on early signs. You would hope that. Well, it, it wasn't just that, though, um, Patrick. It was the, all the symptoms that Terry started to experience. And what the main one was the difficulty following, which, again, in the report, they tried to make out that it happened in the community difficulty swallowing when well, he never did have. So this is what's so sad really when they're desperate to protect themselves. I'm not going to go in for any suing or anything if we have the remedies and that will come a bit later. Um, it, it's just making out as so, though well, telling lies. He never did. Now the difficulty swallowing meant that he wasn't getting any more nutrition and they didn't do a peg feed. I didn't even know what that was till I looked in the records yeah. after he died. Peg feed, what's that? But they didn't know, and that's not been addressed as to why they didn't do it. Mm -hmm. And that was a few days into his nil by mouth. They kept trying to give him little swallowing tests, which didn't work. So that was such a, an, 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 an ADR, you know, adverse drugs effect yeah. of four or five of the drugs he was given, including stomach pain, bleeding in the stomach. Mm. Oh, I could go on the end. Why? Why Mental was he nil by mouth? Why was he nil by mouth? Why was because of the following? Yeah, that ah. started very, very soon. You see, after the um, you know the tripling of the I think that was the tripling of that dose anticonvulsant straight away instead of gradually was a, a, a trigger. And the things like he's crying. I went in the next day. He was crying. He got diarrhea. He got a fever. Now I'm just listing this off from tetra adverse effects I've got in front of me, which are about a 80 or 100 listed. Um, but I didn't look at until yeah on the Friday before he passed away when I knew something was seriously wrong, and I thought I've got to start an investigation here of my own. All of these that I've put um, printed out, and I've put um, the font in red: crying, diarrhea, fever, which made then the, the doctors think that he'd got an infection, which needed another antibiotic. Do you see? That's where the two antibiotics came in. Anti means against, biotic is life. And the adverse effects, and I said this in the meeting in front of the staff, you know, the consultant and what have you, I said, I have never read, I haven't had any cause to, the most jaw-dropping, appalling adverse effects from these, what's supposed to be helping, you know. Again, it's a case, classic case of inversion, isn't it? Well, there's mental, let's go on, mental depression, yep. Um, sleepiness, unusual drowsiness, vomiting, feeling sad or empty, mood or mental changes. These are all, this is exactly what he had, bloating. Now, that's straight after he had the pain in the stomach. The following day, I went in, and although the paracetamol, the painkiller had helped with the pain, his abdomen was really bloated and that was strange. And that's Again, something that I the nurse should have picked up. That is something that the doctor was, he, was on, he was on the ward by this time, Patrick. Right, right. He'd gone up on the ward. So just to clarify, so he had stomach pain in HDU. He was still mm -hmm. discharged to the ward without any investigation? Yeah, now, I'm, I'm knowing that I, I need probably to check the dates and so on. I'm not very good on numbers. I'm mm -hmm. an art teacher and I used to do a lot of English. But there may be that this, um, the pain that I witnessed that was really bad could have been just on the wood. And let me check that. Is that okay, no? Very, yeah, if you've got it here. We've got to continue the conversation. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll have to take a bit of time. I'll come right. back to you on that. Perhaps you can put it right. on your website. That would be but whatever. Great. I mean, doctors and nurses, they're, they're still they're just trained, aren't they? But they don't seem to be trained to, to see adverse effects at all. Well, that, um, uh, well, that's what they should be, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm very not, concerned. That well, this has been on. happening time and time and time again since 1990, when Terry had an operation of his knee. 1995, he had his gallbladder operation and... There were um, problems there that they didn't see. 
1998, the mental breakdown after my daughter took her own life, yeah, yeah. and the adverse effects of the um, antidepressants, not one, two or three at a time, but I didn't know anything then. I'm going back quite a few years, aren't I? Before yeah. I had a computer, yeah. before I, right, I was right. still trying to work, you know, and my living. Right. And nobody noticed. Mm. And that was, and I have, but the good thing about it, it prompted me to do my research. I have about 16 books, a few of the child, just a couple of, you know, the, the um, titles, uh, um, and I learned a lot. My gosh, did I learn. And I what? hadn't a clue about yeah. And when I saw in one or two of the antidepressant side effects could cause suicidal thoughts and seizures and so on, and even... <laughs> And I'm thinking, and I said in the meeting, what is in these drugs? Something is wrong. Mm. You know, and something is desperately wrong. Yeah, and what um, happened on so the ward anyway, then? Sorry? What happened on the ward once your husband was on the ward? What happened? Right, what happened on the ward? Yeah, um, he it, it put him in a side room. The more flat right. he got and the more sort of um, ill uh, and... and, and in a really terrible state, he was on his side, he was on his own room, um, still kneel by mouth, nothing was, um, I noticed he got a thick white coated tongue, mm-hmm. and they kept, this is when I was starting to take more interest, and they told me I could come in um, outside visiting hours. But I, I had a chat with the prescribing doctor, because I was so, upset about everything and he, he ended up not even having the strength to hold my hand and he looked terrible and then um, I had a chat with him. I said I'm worried about the drugs I've had a look at the ward notes now I said he's on a lot more of the drugs than he had before I didn't know then that the kept had been tripled the dose you know I was trying to take in everything and it was basically it was just too full on it's too much he Supported everything. He was quite a nice guy. Um, everything that he'd done, and, and um, we had a long chat because I, I know a lot of background about the medical profession. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, he was a pleasant guy to talk to, but right. he did. I said I'd got power of attorney, and that was when he agreed to take off one of the antibiotics right. and one of the. Um, but that was a few days in now, uh, probably. Right. We can and, not see and, the, in, and in light in light of everything that's happened at that point, there was no consideration for your husband to go back into intensive care. No. And no, why was I, that? I don't know. Now that's the question I'll ask. Mm, I think actually big, that is the big question. Yeah. Can, yeah, can I just say, have you heard of the Liverpool Care Pathway? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Right. Well, that apparently had been stopped a while back. Yes. But looking at what actually happened, you know, and I mean, quite a lot of friends and so on, when I related the story, said, well, it sounds like it's on that care pathway. And that's what I said at, when I went in to pick up the death certificate two or three days after he passed away, and I refused it because it hadn't got the, you know, what I thought he'd passed away of, you know, some of the reactions and it said pneumonia. And now I said, are you sure that it wasn't this Liverpool care pathway? Oh, no, he said. But they just seemed to, you know, come and make him, say, make him comfortable. I mean, he was just absolutely not well, speaking, and, flat out, yeah, almost and, semi-conscious. And, and but and then we saw the... Sorry. Given that he was so ill at that point in time, and you're, you're now mm. referring to the Liverpool pathway, people who are not, mm. our listeners, people who are not familiar with the Liverpool care pathway, it's basically an end of life uh, pathway that has mm. been rolled out by the NHS in the UK a few years back, and now they stopped using mm. it again. But I do know from other clients. So they well, tell us. Well, they tell mm. us, but they, it's still being used. But coming along, so sure, it also would suggest that if they use the Liverpool, Liverpool care pathway, that they made your husband DNR do not resuscitate. Have you got any any information around that? What's your what what's your feeling? It was reversed. Yeah, no. The actual um, um, Terry actually said on day three that he want he, he was confirming the DNR was reverse. I wrote a letter. It was all reversed. Right. Right. There wasn't a DNR in place, yeah. um, but I think they assumed there was. Mm-hmm. And and that, now we, let me get to this bit, which when I just lifted up the 
covered of, of Terry because obviously he was being nursed, well, I thought he was being nursed well. And I was, um, he was flat out. He wasn't really with me. And all I could see under the covers was black, tarry excrement. excrement. Mm -hmm. I was absolutely gobsmacked. I called the nurse quickly and I said, look, what's, what's, what? <sighs> you know, and then when I'm looking at the drug uh, adverse effects after all this happened, after he died, and I went into it in a lot more detail, black tarry stores. Yeah. And, that, and then we and started giving him blood. The next, mm. all, well, let's go back to the black tarry. I mean, yeah. it was a shock. I've never seen any of right, people in right. my life. Yeah. And I called the nurse, and they, they, this is the Saturday before he died on the Sunday. They passed, cleaned him up. You know, I went out there and they cleaned him up and put all the stuff. But you see, it was the weekend. Have you heard about weekend problems in, in hospitals? Oh, look, I mean, staffing, staffing tends to be minimised on weekends for a number of yeah. reasons. And I, I, I mean, that's, not, yeah, that's not, nothing new to me, having worked in IT for 20 years. <laughs> nothing new to me. I'm telling you, a lot of deaths are at weekends. <laughs> and after hours. And after hours. Mm. Mm. Well, anyway, I had to ask, are you going to not go do anything? Send something off for a sample. Mm. And all I got was sort of really blank looks. Nobody really, you know, responded. I suppose they see it a lot. But, but all I kept thinking of, Patrick, what's caused that? I didn't yeah. know there'd been a hemorrhage, nothing. Right. And then when I went in the next morning, he was giving blood. He, he, I said, what, what's going on here? I knew then that the sodium chloride caused swallowing difficulties and fever, and I was upset about that because he was take, having a lot of um, intravenous saline, which you think would be sea salt, healthy salt, it's not. And I knew that then, and I, I just had to, you know, I was really going through quite a lot of those poor, poor old Terry, and I just felt I, I didn't know what to do to help him. Mm. But they were giving, oh, his hemoglobin to load, was yeah. the main yeah, stuff. Yeah, would have been, yeah. Yeah, and I thought then, mm, that's and then she bought the blood, um, you know, the bag, empty bag, when it had come out the, um, the, the unit, yeah. walked past me to go out the room, and tripped, the, and she saw it, trips on the floor, blood, she left it, she left it, I cleared, I've had an apology from that, but I cleared it up with the right. from the, and, and your oh. husband, was he conscious at that point in time still? Not really, but he, I was now, this is interesting, let's just touch this because I know time's going. When I noticed that bit quite coated tongue, this is all coming up towards the last few days, I was concerned and I've had a tip off from a friend who's a complementary health practitioner and he said, that means there's problems in the stomach, there's gastric yeah. problems. Yeah. I said, oh. But they should have picked no, that said, up. Now all I did, Patrick, I went and got the jar of Manuka honey from the supermarket on the way to the hospital. I took it in and I took my own spring water. They put tap water with chlorine and chemicals in it on the patient. So I took my own spring water. I put a little bit of honey in the spring water. Now, he, I know he had meal by mouth because of the swallowing, yeah. but I gave him a teaspoon of this honey and his mouth opened yeah. and he had it. And the last words I heard him say to me was when I said, how do you feel? He said, terrible, but then he's, he's, when I, um, then he opened his mouth and he said, before he opened his mouth, honey, and that's the last words I had. Now, yeah. overnight, yeah. his tongue went pink from giving him the honey. Right. Start, the nurse there that I saw, uh, I went in early, I phoned at half five in the morning to get them to stop these drugs, they still weren't stopped. Um, you know, the, the, because that's all I thought was causing these effects, yeah. side effects. I didn't know about the hemorrhage. Really, even if the drugs had been stopped, Patrick, I think at that stage, I don't think it could have been saved because right. the, no. the well, investigation I did on gastric intestinal hemorrhage can lead to respiratory distress oh, and morbidity. Well, Penny, I'm, I didn't know that. Right. I'm, I'm very conscious of time. Of time, um, I know. Shall, um, what shall we do? No, no, what shall we do? We'll, we'll continue for, you know, we really want to condense this so that people get mm. sort of, you know, the moral of the story, which I'm sure they get by now, but we really got to sort of condense this because we're conscious of time. But okay. um, I'm, I'm surprised. I can't believe that your husband, that nobody sent him back to ICU. I can't believe that. 
you know, with blood no, trans- with no, him being no, I think they... conscious, with him getting mm. blood transfusions. I mm. can't believe mm. nobody sent him back to ICU. I just can't. No, he was only six, 67, and not he was really an, an elderly patient, mm. and and you know, gentle, lovely guy. But what happened right at the end when I I went in the, the Sunday morning, he turned to sleep. I I had an appointment to see the uncle doctor. I took 16. No, not quite. I've got 16, but I took about six of my books in. Um, like what? Um, oh gosh, tox dentistry, a drug may be your problem. What doctors don't tell you? Uh, how to survive medical treatment? You know, good good quality books and some very good. You know, as well. I get the more positive. And um, I talked to this doctor for an hour. Mm. She would not budge with the drugs. She would not budge. And I had to pack it, and I felt so upset that I had to go out the hospital for an hour, a few right. get, you know, outside in. When I came back, Terry had gone into a spiritual distress. Right. They right. called me in. I didn't know that. And I saw into his last breath. And do you know what they said? They couldn't, they were standing around his bed looking at him. Nobody He's got was a mask anything. on, that was all. No tube, nothing. And do you know what they said in the report, and also in the meeting? We let him die peacefully because we thought that any intervention would be more stressful. I am not making this up. Mm. Well, which which is another indicator to me that they might have issued a DNR, do not resuscitate order, without your or your husband's consent. Yeah. Have you yeah. have you found mm. any any evidence in in the notes of that? No, I haven't, but I haven't, I haven't been back, you see. What I need to do is go back to hospital, because I mean, we're talking quite a few months now. The actual NHS meeting was on the 14th of December, and I was on my own. I could have taken a friend, but she wasn't well. Um, and I've done a lot of research. In actual fact, I wrote down the agenda. I did the agenda. They let me, because apparently the meeting's good. Now, this is a good point. And also the remedies. I really wanted to try and get the remedies in. How long have we got to go now? Um, got another five minutes so that we can go for. Oh, no, five minutes. Well, this is what I'm hoping to plan up. Now, the agenda, um, I've got here, you know, I've printed it all out, you know, sent it all out by email. There were six staff um, with, from, the, from the NHS, including the um, consultant, the spiritual consultant, but they did not invite any of the prescribing doctors. I didn't have a say in that, and I did because you'd probably guess from talking to me, I question it. Yes, <laughs> oh, I'm glad I did, because, yeah, the informed consent, Montgomery's law, that's something, let's put that out, do have a look. This is about Montgomery's law that came in in 2015. Miss patient um, consent even higher, or their advocate, you know, some type of attorney. Right, well, I've got here, points of concern to be addressed. A, informed consent of Montgomery's law. B, DNR cancellation. Mm. There was yep. a report. Yep. There was a report in that the Dr. Hay was the on-call doctor, referred to me overturning it during our talk. She, she accused me of overturning that in our talk. Totally untrue. C, my power of attorney, Cobbs in hospital records. D, safety of Terry's prescribed dr- drugs. Com- I wanted confirmation they're tested in combination and not only singly on a fit human. Um, and I wanted um, confirmation that the sudden increase was um, safe, and I didn't get it. Doc, then E, documented adverse reactions to drugs. Um, F, presumed infections, antibiotic side effects. Um, G, severe stomach pain, abdominal bloating. Um, pathologist report of hemorrhage and documented evidence. Of importance of the diagnosis and early treatment. Yeah, so and, the, the, and I think, the, um, and I think is, there is one point that should be on that list as well, from my perspective, just by listening yeah. to his story now in detail. The last point that should, be, or probably should be one of the first points even on this list, should be why was he not readmitted back to intensive care? You know, they, yes, uh, that, is, that, um, that is the big question. Yeah. To me, yeah. you know that that might have prevented his his, his, his mm. passing. Actual fact, um, they may have had no beds. It could may have been absolutely full to bursting. Well, then, then they should have sent him somewhere else. Well, yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, that, that is not, not an excuse in a first world country. Because mm. mm. I, I was so I was just struggling on my own with all this. Mm. I didn't seem to get any help. 
and, and obviously reading all the stuff that was put in, no concern on his war notes. What what are they looking at? But anyway, it goes on. The new uh, yeah, so there's nutrition, meal by mouth, following difficulties, mm. incidences of malaria. Is it? Mm. Yeah, 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 no concern that yeah. 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 yeah, and then it it, it went on. Um, uh, white coated term. This was denied. The the gastro the um, nurses and that there, there was no knowledge that that white coated term had any link with the um, gastric problem. Mm. They didn't know. No. And in the final hours of Terry's life, when I went to the nurse called me and as I came back in the hospital, quick, quick, she says he's going. I thought what? My goodness. And I saw a chest x-ray machine being wheeled out of his room and the, the respiratory consultant in the report said that was probably a junior doctor. A chest x-ray? They, they oh. didn't... Oh. It, 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 within, that, you know. within that time that based on the chest x-ray they could have readmitted him back to inten into intensive care. Yeah, they should have tuned him. Yeah, Why didn't they tuned him? Them? Absolutely. Absolutely. So you've, you've, got, been, you've got a lot of questions to ask to the NHS. And I think the the moral of the story really the moral of the story really pop me off saying you know uh, there was a lot of it was 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 helpful really on the on Joy. I want to just try and find out where they're coming from, and I think it's um, uh, one they're very busy, two the the doctors are trained solidly to ignore adverse drug effects mm. because I think in a way if they admit to that, then that would allow. Uh, you know, medical negligence. Well, I mean, I've, it, it, it's it's a minefield, isn't it, Patrick? It is a minefield, it's but a, I believe you know, medi medical negligence is a strong word. But I think in this case, it's 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 at the right place. This term, you know, I mean, mm. if they let your husband die without escalating treatment, if there is yeah. no DNI in place, then I believe the the term yeah. medical negligence is appropriate. I, I, well, it's, it's like a scenario that you, you, you couldn't make it up. I've never read anything like this. But the plans for remedies is very, very... Because um, right at the end of the meeting, they said that I could be involved in some of the meetings that they have, the well, morbidity meetings, so I've not heard anything. I hope but they're what genuine. I hear, well, I hope, yeah, I hope. there's plans for remedies. Mm. Obviously... Well, Okay, Penny, I'm very Is conscious right, of time. Okay. I'm very conscious of time here. Um, we've got to sort of summarize the our two sure, parts. Can I just go through the panel? Very quickly, remedies, very then? quickly. Right, very quickly. Hang on to your hats. One, educating all medical staff, including that's doctors and nurses, about Montgomery's law and importance of informed consent, plus checking for power of attorney and DNR cancellation, for example, mm. and yep. patients' medical Very records. important. Two, educating all staff to recognise and document documented ADRs, educating medical staff to the fact that drugs are tested singly on sick humans and drug companies do not always publish accurate test results. Mm. Essential books are Bad Pharma by Dr. Ben Goldacre, Confessions of a Medical Heretic by Dr. Robert Mendelssohn, that's MD, your Drug May Be Your Problem by Peter Bregin, MD. Booklet on Patients' Rights, published by What Doctors Don't Tell You. Quote from one of the books, A drug to suppress a symptom does not always cure the underlying problem, but is able to cause more symptoms and a deterioration of the patient, sometimes leading to death. Four, give all medical staff information about the oath of Geneva, especially as many medical herbalists have to take the Hippocratic Oath, which states, first, do no harm make plans to remedy the situation. Uh, five, after adequate research, insist on the replacement of refined denatured sodium chloride in saline solutions, which has documented adverse effects of healthy sea salt. Six, insist that harmful sodium fluoride is taken out of liquid feed supplied by Nutricia. Book, Fluoride Deception by Chris Bryce, an investigative journalist who published after five years of sound research. There's also an as pertain issue here, but that didn't apply on television uh, in Texas care. Seven, educate and bring into practice the prescribing of good quality honey as a natural probiotic. Anti means against, biotic means life. This is an admission that antibiotics have documented adverse effects which are life threatening. Also, use honey to help gastric problems, which are often linked to a white coated tongue. Eight, begin to practice true integrative medicine, which has been advocated by Prince Charles 
in brackets, the royal family takes herbal and homeopathic medicines and lives healthily to a very old age. There is evidence that they have no toxic dentistry or vaccination. That's it. Eight remedies. What are the chances? Of <laughs> That's fantastic. That mm. Look, Penny, I'm I'm very grateful that you shared that you shared shared your story with our listeners. I mean, it's a very it's a very sad story, but you've been mm. you've been kind enough to spend all this this time on the interview and share your story. That's not long ago, mm. really. It's not even 12 months. So, you know, no, I think no. you, you're you probably still going through the motions and I really appreciate you yeah. coming on and sharing this with our listeners and, and hopefully... Oh, thank you. Thank you. Giving an example for them what to pay attention to if they're in a similar situation, if they're concerned about mm. treatment, if they're concerned about how they're dealt with, you know, if they have questions. Not to wait you know, bring it out in the open, do their research before it's mm. too late. Absolutely. I think the thing is, is to, it's the informed consent and it's the questioning in with a friendly level, you know, not, not to, not, it's, it is difficult when you're very worried, obviously, and I've mm. always tried to be, as I've said to doctors quite a few times, that I know you're doing the best you can with the skills you have. I said, but, you know, there are, Certain when tried to tell you things that are uh, are worrying, um, but it was you know when when I started to get involved on that level, it, it basically it was it was looking back, it was too late. The only thing I have learnt an awful lot. Terry has been my teacher, and I really want his death not to be in vain. That some good come from it. Yeah. Yeah. No, Is I that all right? That's, that's, right that's fantastic. That's fantastic. Oh, Penny, that's Penny, Penny, thank you. Well, you're doing a good again. job as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I think we're all trying our our best to mm. educate people. Penny, thank you once again for coming on to this two-part series. If you want to listen to the first part of the interview and you haven't done that, please go back. It's uh, on our podcast series. Um, Penny, I want to thank you once again. Now, for our listeners, check out intensivecarehotline.com. Check out the Your Questions Answer section where we answer all of your questions. You can also get one-on-one -on -one counseling and consulting with me over the phone, via email, or via Skype. Check out that. And if you have any questions, just send us an email to support at intensivecarehotline.com. Penny, once again, thank you so much for sharing the story, and we'll speak soon. It's really, really my, my pleasure, and I'm hoping that some of these remedies will come in. I'll, I'll, shall I keep you um, informed, Patrick? Please, you might please. Please, that would yeah, be great. Yeah, because obviously if the remedies come in, it will affect uh, there's so many, um, so much harm is done um, with the best of intentions mm. to help people by those multi, it's called polypharmacy. Iatrogenic illness is second or third leading cause of death in the States. I don't know what it is over here. Mm. But it seems to be ignored by the medics. Yeah, oh, one thing, so. quick. I did in the, in the meeting make an allusion to the fact that some doctors have, um, uh, you know, kickbacks um, from the drug companies. They mm. have um, mm. in, you know, money or, oh, was I shook up rather <laughs> quickly. I wouldn't be surprised for that. We, didn't we, could want to know about that. we could go on for the next two hours and talk just yeah, about that. Yeah, I know. We'll have that. to stop. <laughs> you okay. take care and lots, lots of love. Thank you so much, Penny. <laughs> take care. Bye. Thank bye, you. Bye, bye. Bye. Bye.